Hello, you've come to learn about why database projects can't leave licenses alone and all the licensing follies of databases and database companies, then you are in the right place. My name is Josh Burkus. I work for Red Hat for the Open Source Practice Office, but I'm not doing this presentation for Red Hat. Instead, I'm doing this presentation for me because I've been a database geek for a long time and I've been a licensing geek for almost as long. What you can get from that is, well, I'm old, but also I'm a bit pedantic and you are about to get the benefit of that. But before we go into ancient history, let's go into recent history, namely 2018. Because in 2018, there were a number of announcements and a number of controversies and a huge stir among technical social media and a lot of people getting angry and getting into arguments on Twitter starting with Redis, who announced the Commons Clause, which they were adding to a bunch of their code. And people found this very controversial. And then MongoDB, who changed their open source license from the AGPL to a brand new license they'd written called the SSPL, which people had a lot of opinions about. And then Confluent took a bunch of their modules around Kafka and changed them from an open source license to a proprietary license. And then CockroachDB took the whole database engine that used to be open source and relicensed it as a proprietary sort of time delay source release license. And a lot of people were asking, why all these announcements and why are people making all of these changes? And most of all, why is it always databases? Well, us old database geeks were not surprised by this. I mean, Monty may look a little surprised in this picture, but believe me, he's not. He's seen more of this than I have, which I'll go into in a minute. But we've seen this before. In fact, database companies have always tinkered with licenses all the time. They can't leave them alone. We could also say this is databases making bad license decisions since 2000. But before we go into bad licensing decisions, let's go into good licensing decisions, or at least normal ones, right? When you start in regular open source project, non-database, regular open source company, how do you do it, right? It's a pretty simple path. First, you develop in private, you do some maybe some proprietary development because you haven't released it yet, and then you launch the project, maybe you launch your company at the same time, you choose a popular open source license that fits with your goals and with your business model. Then you try to build an ecosystem and a community around that project and around your products. Maybe down the line, you have to rev the license to the next release of the license, next version of the license. Uh, maybe you get acquired um, or you IPO and you have to change the licensing in a few modules, but mostly you pick a license, you stick with it. You don't change a lot of things. It's pretty simple. And that's actually good because license stability is good. And license stability is good because a license is not just a license. Licenses are a social contract with you and your community. Licenses set financial expectations for the businesses in your commercial ecosystem, as well as the legal conventions around who can copy the code and who can modify it and everything else. So when you make changes to a license, you are changing all of those things at once. It is intensely disruptive, which is why you generally don't want to do it. Instead, pick a popular license, change as little as possible, if you do have to change it, then socialize each change well in advance and abort license changes if they are harmful. The alternative involves getting a lot of angry emails and a lot of angry direct messages from your partners and from members of your ecosystem and from your community. And then there's the database way, which is complicated. Now, every database starts as a fork of another database, or almost every database, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that go on with different licenses and unapproved licenses and multiple versions of licenses and client modules under a different license and maybe even taking the whole thing proprietary again. But rather than discuss this in theory, let's talk about a few examples. And of course, we can't talk about open source databases without talking about MySQL. Now, if you've been around for a while, you might know that MySQL, as originally released, was not open source. In 1995, it was released under a license that was free for personal use, but you had to have a contract for commercial use. This kind of licensing is known as shareware, and it has a long and broad tradition going back in the software world. It's still used today. 
Now, MySQL allegedly had some code from MSQL, according to some people who were there at the time, I don't really know, um, that was also shareware. Thus, every database is a fork of another database, but that doesn't really matter for their licensing. So then in 2000, things changed. They re-released MySQL as GPL version two. And Monty became a huge champion of the GPL and free software. Now the database client was under the LGPL to make it compatible with differently licensed programming languages and clients and tools. But even though Monty was a big champion of freeware, MySQLAB, the company, promoted this idea that if you were doing open source hacking, then you could use the GPL version of MySQL. But if you were using MySQL in a business, however you were using it, you needed to get a commercial license from them. And this scheme was called dual license. Now you will notice that these terms sound very similar to what I earlier called shareware. And it is similar. But dual licensing has been around for quite a while as one of the primary ways to make money off of open source, which was fine until 2004 when they suddenly, and by suddenly I mean in a minor update, changed the license of the database client to GPL 2.0. And this caused a lot of pushback and gnashing of teeth because they also introduced an enterprise edition they had to add this FOSS exception thing the community manager got intensely frustrated and walked out of the company and the big big issue about this is that probably two-thirds three-quarters of the developers who work with MySQL were writing in PHP and one of the licenses that is not compatible with the GPL at the time anyway was the PHP license so suddenly the majority of MySQL's developer audience could no longer use the database. And so they had to add this thing called a PHP exception. But after a while they found out that wasn't good enough. So they added this FOSS exception to cover other open source in order to allow them to still use the database even though everything was GPL now. And I'll give you a hint. If you find yourself doing something like this, you've made a bad decision somewhere up the line. And maybe it's time to stop and take three steps back and revisit your goals. Now, while MySQL is the best known open source database, it's not the oldest. Let's talk about Ingress. Now, Ingress is maybe the second database, relational database out there. 1974, started at UC Berkeley, got spun out to a for-profit Ingress Corporation, 1980, then got acquired by ASK, then that got acquired by Computer Associates. So it has been around the block. 30 years of history before 2004, it went open source. However, it didn't get released under any of the licenses that were popular at the time. It got released under a brand new license written by Computer Associates called the Trusted Open Source License. It was sort of Apache Mozilla-ish, but different. And now they did submit this to the OSI and they did get the license approved. But even though it was approved, this one license that was only used for two projects anywhere, wasn't even used elsewhere in CA, gave people a lot of trouble. They weren't familiar with the license. They didn't understand it. Developers were nervous about it. Users were nervous about it. And as a result, it became a big inhibition to Ingress getting the kind of adoption that MySQL and PostgreSQL were seeing. So in 2005, uh, CA spun off Ingress to Ingress Corporation. No, not that Ingress Corporation, not the one from the 80s. That was gone. This is a brand new Ingress Corporation, coincidentally with the same name. And that Ingress Corporation reevaluated and took two steps back and then re released Ingress under the GPL version 2. Now, it's under popular open source license. That should be the end of our story. Except that they forgot to socialize the license change with an important group of people, namely the Ingress developers many of whom were actually very anti-GPL and they were very loudly anti-GPL. And as a result, the change to the GPL did not really do Ingress any good in terms of adoption. So the database hung around for a while, went into sort of a decline, never really saw a lot of popularity in open source until in 2010, they had their last open source release. And by 2017, it had been combined with another database and released under a proprietary license called Pactian Nets. Now, one last old database before we get into newer stuff. Interbase, great database, was released as open source. Weirdly, the name was not released also, so they had to rename it into Firebird Database, um, the open source version that is. And before we go into what was wonky about Firebird Interbase, um, 
I need to introduce a term that is often used in license review. Now, if you watch a lot of Monty Python, you have probably seen the sketch with Eric Idle and John Cleese, where Eric Idle is trying to get a license for his pet fish. And as part of the sketch, he hands John Cleese a cat license. And John Cleese famously said, that's not a cat license. That's a dog license where you cross dog out and wrote cat on it in crayon. And thus originated the term crayon license, because a lot of companies seem to be unable to resist taking a popular, well-known, well-understood license and just modifying it a little to make it their own, thus leading to problems. Now, how this relates to Interbase Firebird here is it was released under two different licenses. One was called the IPL, which was a sort of hacked version of the Mozilla public license. And then it was called the IDPL, which applied to different parts of inter, uh, Firebird's code, which was also a hacked version of the MPL. So you had two different crayoned versions of the MPL applying to different parts of the code. And neither of these were submitted to the OSI. I don't think they were submitted. Certainly they were never approved by the OSI. And as you can imagine, this led to some problems with Firebird attracting contributors to the project. Now, enough with the ancient databases. Let's actually come up to more recent times. Let's talk about MongoDB, released in 2009 under the AGPL version 3 license. Now, today the AGPL is an accepted mainstream license, but at the time it was still controversial. It was relatively new. It had these network copyleft permissions, which were very controversial among a lot of people. They weren't sure that they were legally enforceable. They weren't sure that they should be enforced, etc. And for a startup, there was also the controversy around combining the AGPL with a contributor license agreement, which then kind of de facto made for a combination where commercial usage by other companies was very, very difficult. Thus, sort of turning it into non-commercial shareware again, at least if you follow this theory. However, that controversy did not, in the end, hurt MongoDB at all. As a matter of fact, they were tremendously successful, saw huge adoption, lots of users, and eventually a very, very successful IPO in 2017. So lots of stock, made a bunch of money, and their stock has continued to do well after that. But one of the things that comes along when you have a big market cap and lots of stockholders is pressure to constantly increase revenue. And constantly increasing revenue means getting creative. And we're talking about a database company here. So what do you think they did? Yep, of course, a new license. MongoDB released their new version under the server-side public license that they had just drafted. And then they submitted it to the OSI. But here's the thing, the SSPL made some very radical extensions to the domain of copyleft to the things that the license applied to and therefore required to be open source. And this resulted in months, five months of intense debate on license review about whether you could make those sorts of changes and whether the wording was good and whether or not you should make those kinds of changes and all these other things. And eventually what happened was MongoDB got really tired of all this debate. A lot of it was fairly acrimonious, so I can understand this. and withdrew the SSPL from consideration, which means that MongoDB is still being released under the SSPL and it might be open source and it might not be open source and we just don't know. Now, one last database in our little tour here, one of my favorites, Redis, was released in 2009, uh, along with a lot of other non-relational databases um, under the BSD license, uh, so super permissive, created by Salvadori Sanfilippo while he was working for VMware, and it wasn't a product, which is part of the reason why it could be so permissive. It was not commercialized at all for, for years, really, but it did get extremely popular because lots of people liked it, developers liked it, database geeks liked it, I liked it a lot, um, still like it, and eventually somebody said, hey, this database is so popular, we should create a startup around it. So they did, they launched Redis Labs and Redis Labs hired Salvatore away from VMware. And they added a bunch of enterprise features to make money and the enterprise features were liced, not BSD licensed, they were licensed differently from the core engine. Uh, some under the Apache license and some under the AGPL v3 license. See, there's the AGPL again. And that was okay for a couple of years. Um, people were, were used to that, you know, if they were using the enterprise features, different licenses applied and then, 
Redis announced this of the Commons Clause. Let me read you a phrase of the Commons Clause, right? The grant of rights under the license will not include, and the license does not grant you the right to sell the software. It is non commercial. This was added as a rider onto the Apache license, you know, Apache plus Commons Clause, and it had a strict non commercial restriction. Allowing Redis Labs to at the same time produce both shareware and a crayon license, which is some kind of an accomplishment. And as a result, they had to then get rid of some FUD and explain, no, the core engine is still BSD. You can still use this. This only applies to the modules. And this was so much trouble that eventually they abandoned the whole effort. And they took those modules and they put them under a more straightforward source available proprietary license um, and gave up on this whole Commons Clause thing. Now, if you've been listening to me talk, one of the things you may be asking yourself is, why? Why are databases like this? Why do they have to be so complicated? Why do you have to tinker with licenses all the time? And I asked this question on social media and I got some interesting responses, which came down to basically three reasons. And one has to do with the unquestioned financial leader in the database field, namely Oracle. And Oracle has made billions of dollars and a lot of the way they've made that money is via licenses licenses for the database and licenses for plugins and licenses for training and licenses for resellers and reams and reams of paperwork. And as a result, whenever anybody thinks, how do I make money off this database? They cannot help but think of licensing. Reason number two has more to do with startups and venture capital, which is if you look at database startups, they take a long time, an average of about nine years to reach an exit strategy, an IPO or an acquisition or whatever. And as a result, the VCs, by the time of this exit, they have a huge stake in the database company, which means they also need to make a lot of money off of that database company, which means they want them to get creative with revenue. And getting creative for revenue in the world of databases so often means messing with licensing. And the last reason I can explain in three letters, S, QL, structured query language, an international standard and importantly, one that commodifies databases. It creates a universal API for databases, in theory anyway. And as a result, developers and users have the expectation that regardless of what database is on the other end of that pipe, it will behave similarly. And the problem with that is that you as the owner of a new database have to every day compete feature for feature and price for price against the other databases in the industry. And even the non-relational databases, the no SQL databases have been pressured to commodify by their users, interesting things like GQL and graphical QL and SQL compatibility. And the problem with commodification is you don't get what financiers call stickiness. All the time you have to worry about your users defecting because they can. And as a result, this tinkering around with licenses is never going to leave us. So the next time that you are reading Hacker News and you hear about people having a fight over some license terms or another, and it somehow always seems to involve a database, well, just understand that's just databases doing what they do. Now, thanks everyone, and I am now prepared to answer your questions. There we go. Howdy. So, um, if you have questions, go ahead. Let's see if we have any of the shared notes. Ah, do you foresee any uptake of this SCAL in the database space? I certainly hope so. Um, this is why both uh, Henrik and I spent so much time um, talking in license review about the terms and trying to make sure that it would be an acceptable license to the OSI because we're very interested in the potential of it for database project licensing, particularly things like distributed databases. Um, so far, aside from the original um, uh, cryptographic hyperledger project, um, nobody has adopted it yet, um, but it's still very new. Um, and and I'm, I'm really hoping that it can become a tool for public interest databases where they want to make sure that they don't get bad actors taking some of the data proprietary. Um, that, that was a big part of my hope for the license.
Yeah, Henrik points out one reason that database companies can change licenses is they're often VC funded single vendor products. Um, and um, one thing I'll point out is that that's actually not always true. Um, conspicuously absent from the licensing follies was PostgreSQL. Um, I also uh, SQLite, in fact, um, both of which because those databases accepted contributions with no copyright assignment and as a result are permanently under their respective licenses um, and, and unable to relicense. The, um, and that's true of, of Linux, it's true of most programming languages. Um, I, the, at one point, because the PostgreSQL license has the same material terms as the BSD license, but different language, we looked at changing it to be the BSD3 clause license to be consistent with other projects. And the amount of effort and the number of people we'd have to track down, some of whom had passed away, so we'd have to track down their estate in order to get them to reassign things, um, would have been truly nightmarish. So, um, but yeah, but, but Henrik is correct that a lot of this has to do, you know, as I say in my reasons, with venture capital funded projects. Um, okay, so more questions. Um, uh, are there any non-VC funded uh, Ludovic said, are there any non-VC funded database companies which would show that they can fund themselves and not tinker with the licenses? I, I think, or I think you mean, v um, in terms of non-VC funded companies, um, we have plenty of services companies. Uh, the database realm has been popular with services companies such as Percona, um, such as Enterprise DB, such as Second Quadrant, such as um, there's another multi database company that's primarily um, MySQL, but also does a lot of other database systems. I'm not remembering the name right now. Um, the um, uh, as well as some of the big service providers that also offer database support um, for some open source databases, um, and for that matter, the web hosts, right? Um, because clearly. Um, uh, for their MySQL and PostgreSQL um, services, uh, Amazon and Google and Azure have not had to touch the licenses at all. Um, so uh, it is completely possible to make money off of databases without uh, monkeying with licensing. Um, and, and that's been demonstrated. It's just that you need to go into services and support and hosting if you want to take that route, um, apparently. Um, although I would argue that the changes to licenses have not necessarily benefited these VC funded companies. Um, does this seem like it's more of an expression of control with CLAs and dual licensing? I suppose a lot of it is about control. Um, I'm relatively, for all of the ones uh, such as MySQL where I'm familiar with some of the background reasoning that went into the license change, it's very revenue motivated. As in, there wasn't a motivation for control outside of creating revenue. Um, in the case of uh, MySQL, it was specifically because of the closed box reseller market. Um, and they wanted to make sure that those people were getting commercial licenses. Um, and, and that was largely the motivation. Um, so. One more question, what do you think the DB licensing world will look like in 10 years? Um, I think uh, that uh, in the end, most of these databases will end up under some mainstream open source license, um, except for some extension of copyleft, like which might be Cal, it might be something else. I think there will be more attempts to extend copyleft into the area of data um, because for database applications, it's increasingly difficult to differentiate between data and code in terms of how these applications actually work. And so I think we're gonna see more extension of copyleft in that area specifically for database applications and database infrastructure. Um, uh, beyond that, um, I think as happened in previous cycles, as happened in the cycle in the mid-aughts, 
I think a lot of these experiments with non-open source licenses will ultimately die out. Um, uh, among other things, there are too many good databases that are clearly open source licensed competing with them. Um, and on the proprietary licensing front, nobody does proprietary licensing better than Oracle. And so if you've decided to compete in the proprietary license database market, you're competing with Oracle, which is a tough road to hoe. Um, so um, I guess I still have time left. So let's take another question from Ludovic. Yep. I uh, could we argue that all, I'm going to summarize. Um, we argue that all VC funded database plays will end up taking the license and therefore go to shareware or near proprietary model. And thus those companies will kill the open source nature of the database or inspire a split in the community. Um, I could see that happening. I mean, technically, even though it was completely corporately funded, um, open elastic, open elastic search um, is a a split um, or a fork, if you will. Prefer the term split because with GitHub and everything, the term fork is confusing. Um, so, um, so technically, the elastic search situation uh, is in fact a split, um, specifically over licensing. So, um, yeah, we'll probably see some of that. Um, and in the end, the other thing that's going to happen is that some databases are going to die out. People forget, um, I did an accounting for one of the startups I work with back in 2004, and I think we had 20 financially successful, as in over $10 million um, SQL databases, most of which are gone now. Um, and a lot of the databases that people are hearing about today ultimately will not survive or they will merge with something else. Um, so I think we're going to see more winnowing in that respect. And playing, you know, with licenses in a way that offends your users will cause, will be a, a cause of failure for some, um, but not all of them. So thank you, everybody. Um, I am going to pop over to the Red Hat Open Source and Business hallway. Uh, session. I hope to see you there. Um, I'll be happy if you think of another question about this, go ahead and take it over there um, and I will take it. Thank you very much everyone for attending and this was a lot of fun for me. I hope it was a lot of fun for you. Thank you, Josh. We appreciate your time and effort and we will see you all in the next sessions. Take care.